Uh, got it. All right, that was the ceremonial starting of the recorder and welcome to the October Silicon Valley Fourth Interest Group. I am the program chairman uh, with, uh, with authority to uh, say who goes next. So uh, the rules are introduce yourself. If you're not speaking, uh, be sure to mute. Thank you all for muting. Uh, the first uh, presentation today is the challenge. Bill, you're on. Very good. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'm Bill Ragsdale here. I'm one of the original co-conspirators on the fourth interest group. We started underneath an oak tree at the Stanford campus in about 1978. And I think two of us are still alive. I'm not sure about Kim Harris, but anyway, uh, we're gonna go to the challenge. And do we have any people- Was John Jameson uh, one of the originals? Yeah, John James is still alive and kicking. And um, uh, he's, I forget where he showed up, but uh, hold on, I gotta not share. Uh, but he showed up uh, on, a, uh, on uh, Facebook or somewhere. Somebody had some links with him um, and uh, invited him back, I think, to give it to, to link up here. Uh, let's see, I think, uh, uh, Brad, do you have a, uh, uh, a challenge? I'll set, this, I'll set the scenery on this. The challenge this time was to develop a word set for 20 or so words, some number of words, and then develop a process to divide them into syllables. And uh, uh, so I'll, with that basis, we'll turn it over to Brad and see what you came up with. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Let me find the, the right button. Here we go. Um, so, um, I, I did something imprecise, but, but easy. Cause I, I spent very little time after I got my, my talk ready prepping for it. But basically I, I had this vague idea that, well, let me, let me try to do something kind of recursive that, that, uh, is, is approximately right. And so I said, well, I'll need to know, convert every, I'll need to be able to convert things to uppercase and then I can check to. To, to see if I've got a vowel or, or, or not. And, and I included the letter Y in, in vowels. And then I, I created a word vowel number that counts the number, number of vowels in a, in a counted string. And then the core of the, the thing is just a thing called stem that uh, goes in, it, it's, it's just a bag of kind of silly heuristics. So, you know, if you count and you find you've got something with, with no, no vowels, uh, then, uh, then I go ahead and uh, I print it and, and don't, don't leave a gap because that, that probably is attached to something else. And then if I, uh, if I find that I've got less than, uh, less than, uh, or sorry, one, only one vowel, then, then it's probably a good time to, to spit out what I've got. And then otherwise, <clears throat> as, uh, I keep, uh, if I've, I've got less than five characters, then I kind of look at the, uh, percentage of, of vowels versus not and decide whether it seems like enough that I, I want to break it out uh, as one one word or I then just cut the thing down the middle. And uh, I, I'm not sure it's a perfect heuristic, but it, it comes up with something that uh, that, that is, is right some percentage of the time. So in any event, you know, I feed in some words like this. And then, oh yeah, and I'm sorry, I got this test word that parses a word, you know, just from the the data from the uh, the fourth input stream, and then uh, prints it out uh, and prints out its uh, decomposition. So uh, tried words like these, and uh, this is what I got. It's not stellar, but it it uh, and there are definitely uh, things in here, right? Where uh, so Robert did pretty good. Tangential, <laughs> presidential, <laughs> robotic, but but it does it does, it does, it's it's a partially right, <laughs> and so it's it, it, interesting how how if you you know sort of throw 
uh, random heuristics of the thing, you can, can at least get partway there. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Bill. I particularly like uh, Playbill, where it uh, it takes compound word and splits compound words, which is good and proper. Uh, uh, it would be good to check it with prefixes, uh, like a, a preview or uh, suffixes like bad and badly. Uh, but you made tremendous progress on what? 35 lines of code? Yeah. So, uh, um that's a uh that's that's an impressive start i mean a very impressive start in 35 lines of code and of course we all can pat ourselves on the back about how productive fourth is as a language and what you know i don't i don't i don't know another language what that would take but uh i think probably something like maybe two pages of code or something anyway very very good uh does anyone else have any uh, responses to the challenge Okay, hearing none, I will uh, take control. Let's see, your screen. Good. And away we go. I made a nice compound word, syllabification. I was trying to find some way to express the project without using four or five words, and I came up with that. So I'll restate the challenge and uh, whoop, ahead. So this was to create a word list, uh, a set of rules to parse them. And then I had the thought about reaching ahead on the types of words and what to include. Uh, it turns out in the project I did, I didn't do anything about that third item. And um, the question on uh, idea, is this uh, I, is it difficult or easy? And uh, I found out it is much more difficult than I had realized. Let's see if I can hide this video panel. Whoops. Hold on, I'm trying to rearrange my screen on the fly. Very good. So here is the major uh, summary on all, all that I did. So I, I, once I got into this, I very quickly found out that you really need to know the sounds of letters, silent letters and diphthongs and vowels that split uh, uh, emphasis. So it immediately came realized that you need a, you need access to a dictionary that tells you what these sound sources are. And of course, if you have access to such a dictionary, they already have the uh, the the syllable structure in the dictionary. So it's kind of a um, of a recursive cat chasing its own tail. Uh, if you have the dictionary, you don't need the syllable structure and vice versa. Uh, once I got into this, I started realizing that this integrates a lot of computer science components, you know, a database, a parsing, uh, pattern matching, and then uh, uh, different analysis methods, uh, rule based, database, parsing trees, and so on. And, and I'm sure there's probably two or three more that I'm not even aware of. So what I'm doing today barely touches on the process of the syllable detection, but it proves feasibility. And uh, all I all I wanted to do was be able to, to, to get it uh, get it to a working stage, develop at least one rule, and which is exactly what I did. I, I popped onto the internet to say, uh, what is the rule set for generating syllables? And I found out uh, almost the first uh, section I got was beautifully done. It was a full rule set. And so I pondered on this rule set for a while. Uh, I'll review the rules very quickly. I only use one out of this selection. The first rule was that you need at least one vowel in a, in a uh, syllable. That doesn't tell you very much. 
but it's sort of a negative rule. Uh, if you're parsing out something that doesn't have a vowel in it, then uh, you've got to rethink it. The second rule is that uh, double consonants, you divide in between. That's a very simple one. That's, that's quite doable. Uh, things like rabbit and letter, as you see in the examples. Uh, rule number three, now you start to need, need the uh, sound of the vowels, long sound or short sound. And so they have some examples there like basic and robot uh, divided uh, after the vowel. And in some cases, uh, like river and model, it's divided uh, before a vowel. And there's the general exception on that. So that one's a, a pretty, pretty nasty looking rule. Rule number four is uh, you can divide by, uh, between vowels that make two sounds, but now you need to know that the uh, I, E, and diet makes two different sounds. It isn't DEET, it's diet. Rule number five, prefixes and suffixes are separate. So words that end in, in, in less and ing and ness and ly are um, uh, the, the uh, suffix parses out. Rule six, with compound words, uh, this is one like Bart had, uh, the uh, things like cupcake, two compound words without, uh, babysitter divides and so on. And rule seven, we'll talk a lot about rule seven because that's the one I honed in on. I looked down the list and I said, what do I think is doable and what do I think is interesting? And I came up with rule seven. And so that's what I've explored. And so it has two situations and they're both done strictly by parsing. So you examine to see if you have an LE ending a word and there's a consonant before the LE uh, like, like uh, PLE, then you divide just before the EL, oh, pardon me, just before the LE. And the examples there are able, candle and so on. And the exception to that, which is actually a, another rule is that all words ending in CKLE, you divide before the LE. So the, the uh, CK is always a part of the prior syllable and the LE is its own syllable. So I took rule seven to explore. In doing this, as I mulled over this and thought about it, I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I got a sheet of paper in front of me and I looked at that and I said, well, I'm gonna write rule seven. And I was able to write out rule seven almost immediately. It's a you know, very simple, straightforward parsing. So the, along the way on the project, I got a number of questions. Uh, one is once you divide syllables, should you put dashes in between? Should you put spaces in between, put dots in between? How to identify? And so being a basic computer scientist, I said, I'm gonna use numbers. So what I decided to do was whenever a rule is applied, use the rule number as a separator. This is very nice for debugging because once you do a, a dump on a whole word list, you can see where the rules were applied and uh, which rule it was. Then I thought, do I analyze letter by letter or by letter groups? And I started off with letter by letter because it's a very simpler linear logic. You look at a letter, you make a decision. Look at a letter, make a decision. You have to do some backtracking and a little bit of look ahead, but your, your fundamentally your decisions are done letter by letter. And then we get into things like diphthongs, uh, vowels, uh, double consonants, and so on. And in dictionaries, they give these separate symbols. They have uh, uh, diuresis over vowels. Uh, they have like AE as its own little symbol. Uh, there is a, I think it's a soft Y has a symbol called a thorn. So, uh, this is way beyond anything I was going to tackle today. Do we scan well, letters and words uh, left to right or right to left? And I realized that we're gonna have to do both. Uh, immediately the, the rule seven scans from the end of the word toward the beginning. So immediately I had to start scanning backwards. And finally then what decision structure to use? Uh, the classical very earliest expert systems use if, if else then rules they matured into things that are table driven, uh, which are more general and easier to expand. And then you have such things as uh, tree structure. And then I'm sure there are several levels beyond that that I did not even get uh, toward. So in my case, I'm just using an easy start with some if else rules. 
And although I do think a parse tree becomes much more general. So the word list, I just went back to the list of those seven examples and I just took all the words out of those examples because I know the correct answer. It's nothing like solving a puzzle if you know what the answers are. So you can see the word list starts out with the banana, apple, and children, and so on, and goes down to at the bottom of saber, savior, and uh, savior, savor, and savior. I've highlighted in red the, the words that are affected by rule number seven able, candle, fumble, apple, table, castle, tickle, and tackle. The result this shows the uh, uh, the uh, formation of the syllables to entire word list, and I've broken out and highlighted the words that are affected by Rule 7a and Rule 7b. So the algorithm on the whole overall program is probably exactly what you'd expect. We develop a list of the target words. Uh, you from that list you extract a word by word by word, and then once you've got a word, you've got to start developing rule structures. And there are seven different rules. And again, I took the last one. So we form a rule for the simplest case and apply that rule. And then uh, if you wish, develop some more rules for other words. Otherwise, I applied that rule to the full list, saw what I got. And uh, then uh, to the limit of your patience and endurance, you can uh, develop additional rule sets. And of course, as I've said, going much beyond this, you start to need access to a phonetic dictionary. So let's apply rule number seven. First rule seven A, uh, to review, we divide, uh, be, if, there, if a word ends in LE and there's a consonant before the L, you divide uh, after the consonant and the two vowels. So able becomes A and then BLE, candle becomes C-A-N hyphen or uh, C-A-N space D-L-E, uh, 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 two phonemes there. The variation, which is essentially another rule, says that any word ending in C-K-L-E, you divide uh, the, for the, uh, the uh, last two letters stand alone. So the, the in tickle, the C-K is in the leading uh, syllable and the L-E is in the trailing. The rule is down below written in English. It's, uh, this is, this is the, the link I did on a piece of scratch paper sitting at the kitchen table. And it said, now my, my notation is that the letter tilde zero says, what is the last trailing letter? Letter tilde one is what is the letter second from the end? Letter tilde two is three from the end and so on. So this is parsing the, the word, uh, from uh, right to left. If the last letter is not an E, then exit because the, the rule does not apply. If the next to last letter is not an L, you exec it because the rule does not apply. Then if the next prior letter is a K and before that is a C, now we have C, K, L, E. So you place the seven, the digit seven, the character seven at the divider. And in your word list, it will show up as CK7LE and exit, you're done. The final component says, if the second to the end letter is a consonant, then you place seven as the divider. So in words, it's pretty lengthy, but in codes, it's pretty terse. Here's a uh, D chart of it. We first check for E, yes. We check for L, yes. We check for K and C, yes. And at the extreme right bottom, we place the CK7LE. If we have the L, the EL, and not the CK, then we check for the presence of the consonant. If the consonant is present, then we can place the, the consonant 7LE. Uh, if all the answers are no, no actions taken, we go on to the next rule. Here's the code. Beautiful fourth. The uh, a word. Fetch tilde zero fetches that last character. We compare it to ASCII E. And if it does not match, we exit. We then fetch the second to the last letter, ASCII L. If it does match, again, we exit. Now we get the third to the last letter. If it's a K, and we fetch the fourth to the last letter, if it's a C, and they match together. Now we have rule 7B in effect. 
two says where to insert the separator, and then we insert uh, according to rule seven, which we'll see in a moment. The last case is if the third from the last is a consonant, then we uh, insert the, uh, the uh, seven at the third position from the end, and we then uh, do that insertion by rule seven. So at the bottom, we see Tickle goes to TICK7LE and Apple goes to AP7PLE. How do we fetch the ending letters? This is our favorite Bills does. We give it a parameter, which is going to tell us where to do the insertion or where to do the selection, the offset from the end. Create comma saves that parameter and then does, fetches the parameter, go through a calculation and um, it returns the character um, the, at that position. We then create four words. Zero fetch tilde gives us the zero uh, ending character. One fetch gives us the second from the end, third from the end, and fourth from the end. Now here's how we uh, do the insertion. When, once we have a rule seven, we have to insert the, uh, the character seven in the proper place. And the first three lines is a C move. What that does is it goes into the text buffer and it slides the last three characters over, uh, making space for the seven. Then the ASCII seven swap C store punches a seven in the middle of the text string. And the one plus two target size increments the string because we've added a letter to it. So this spreads the contents in the target buffer and starts the marker. marker. Uh, I haven't done a lot of string use and forth, you know, moderate amount. And I was a little dicey on, is this gonna be complicated or difficult? And I found out it's very straightforward. You just gotta keep your word positions, uh, keep clear on what the word positions are, but I programmed um, uh, quite straightforward. This is the overall run program that does it all, run test. Uh, it reads the word set from a disk file, puts it into a buffer, it extracts uh, word by word, applies the rule, and then gives us a report. So you can see restart words, uh, uh, initializes the list to, to um, the full list that's on the disk. My file words calculates how many words are in that file, and then we do a do loop to process each word sequentially. Get word reaches into the buffer, grabs a word, steps over it, puts it into a buffer. Rule seven applies the parsing to that particular word. And then we type the target buffer. So if rules were added after rule seven, you could put rule one, two, three, four, five to the limit of your project. Here's how we pull a word out of the input stream. This is uh, again, the, the uh, top level. But the demark word goes into the input buffer, the uh, file buffer, and marks off where the next word is located. Copy demarked, pulls it into a, a uh, temporary buffer, and then eat demarked steps over it for the next times. So at that point, we have a word in the uh, in the working text buffer. Uh, housekeeping: These are the workspaces necessary. The, uh, I'm using the uh, uh, ANSI 4th that's in Win32 4th uh, to do file access. Works amazingly well. You, um, you've got a, a lot of little housekeeping and busy work going on reading the files and then handling error codes that come back. But once you've got it written out, it's, it's very clean. And so you see the, the elements we need to do the file access is its name. You get a file handle or, or uh, from the system. You determine a size, location, offset, and number of words. These are used throughout. And the workspace for the target word is very simple. It's just a target buffer with 20 letters. And these are uncounted. And then to know the size of the word you're using is there's a, a, a value of target size. This is how many letters are in the target word. Uh, so this is our result. This is uh, output taken right off of the, uh, uh, the IDE for 132.4. The uh, rules are not in place for other words. Babysitter, classroom, breakfast, sunflower are scanned and do not qualify. 
And then we see the ones ending in LE. So there's ABEL with a seven. So it's, it's A, seven BLE, it's the, the, uh, the uh, uh, phonetic division is between A and B. Same with candle, fumble, apple, and table. They all are BLEs. But when uh, there is um, a um, CKLE, that particular pattern then parses out to give us a, a CK7LE. So those two at the bottom. And then finally at the bottom are again words that were not processed, Sabre. Um, I like that Sabre because we had an office on Sabre Street and it was the S-A-B-R-E French spelling. So we always had to spell the name of the street whenever we gave it over the telephone. Otherwise, the mail's going to come to S-A-B-E-R. So summary. Um, well, we've all done a lot of parsing of computer text. And the intent is to keep it as regular as possible. And so the parsing is really quite straightforward, rule-based, very simple. So that's why I thought this was going to be straightforward. And that was an uh, incorrect assumption. So the project was much more involved than I thought because uh, phonetics are not rule-based. They are human-based and they are brain-based. So developing the file access and support took a couple of hours. I took some prior applications and rewrote them and massaged them. And every time I would write a segment, I wrote a little test routine. So all of my code has uh, has a you know a, a new word or two and then a test routine all the way through. I carry the test routines all the way to the end because if I go way back up in the prior earlier code, make a change, I want those tests to be repeated every uh, every time I re reload the system. And in the 132 fourth on a contemporary computer, the processing time is so fast the the uh, Delay time on this project uh, from when you hit the compile button is is maybe 20 milliseconds. Uh, uh, very quick. Maybe now more like 200 milliseconds. Uh, the interesting part, the aha was that to develop the code for rule seven took about five minutes. So with all the work to get the environment going, once I was in rule development, it took about five minutes. So uh, by inference, one could say you could develop all the other rule sets in a half an hour. I don't think that would be the case, but the simple rule took a, just a few minutes. And as I said at the beginning, a full project would require dictionary access. And you would have to expand your notation because you're now handling uh, letter combinations that would uh, most likely uh, need their own uh, symbol and um, symbol sets. So, that would be, a, you know, again, add a, another level of complexity. So we see picking a simple target, rule seven, easy to, to uh, parse out. Uh, we got a quick start on the project and it's enticing to say, would this be a motivation to continue to do some more? Uh, do we have any questions? I'd see we're all in shock, stunned silence, which is no problem at all. It, okay. it, it, it was kind of neat to have one that was uh, um, challenging enough that, that, that it was unlikely you were going to get the get the answer, and and uh, sort of had to had to figure out what what's next best. And yeah, that was an accidental uh, fun one, I think, in some ways. Well. Uh... But they, what's that phrase, that which does not kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> so it didn't kill me and it made me stronger. And then we, it matured my uh, file parsing. It's kind of the first time I have parsed live out of the file buffer. Normally I copy the file into RAM. And uh, so there was learning experience. So, uh, so anyway. Uh, Back to uh, Kevin, and thank you for your rapt attention. Oh, I see. Mr. Steven is waving his hand, but he's muted. And he's talking. Steven, do you have a question? 
No, I'm sorry. I was waving at my mom. She's 83. I thought, you know, she likes that commercial with the owl saying, hi, mom. I thought, hi. <laughs> um, are you moving towards a, uh, I don't know, a domain specific language for processing text? Oh, no, 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 no. This was just a, a mental challenge. It's just a little you know, we do every month we try to do a programming challenge, something that can be done in say half an hour. Uh, this was 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 significantly more involved. So it's a demonstration projects. Uh, Kevin did one that I think, how long did it take you, Kevin, to develop the, the code that you showed us earlier? That was Brad. Or Brad, I mean, pardon Brad. Um, I, I think I spent, uh, maybe maybe an hour or 45 minutes something like that i was you know sort of and finished my finished my my slides and it was actually quite late at night and i'm like well i'll, I'll give bill's challenge a try and oh boy so well, that's good that that fulfills the the goal of something you can do in one sitting that's interesting uh and has an endpoint uh and also is pedagogically interesting. So, uh, and this pro project for me grew to the point where it was no longer interesting. So that becomes the end of the project. Any other questions or comments? Okay, back to Kevin. Thank you, team. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bill, for a wonderful challenge. Uh, we have yet to understand whether there'll be one on fourth day. And speaking of fourth day, I'm uh, pleased to announce that uh, fourth day is, uh, is gonna expand into the afternoon. Uh, we will most likely be having Chuck Moore and Green Arrays uh, first uh, to suit the new, uh, the new region, the new domain in which we find ourselves. Uh, Leon Wagner from Fourth Incorporated has agreed to present. He'll be uh, live at Stanford, which uh, is like totes awesome. Uh, we What's still need on? folks. Go ahead. What's Leon speaking on? Uh, good question. Uh, to be announced. Uh, everybody gets in a, a two line. Uh, Thing and uh, a title and a two-line description of their talk, and it'll all be on Meetup, uh, probably 20 minutes before the start of the, well, never mind. That's uh, just uh, too, too uh, much in depth on my own failings. Uh, so- His, uh, uh, Leon's, Leon's presentation in the past have generally been on very significant applications. And um, ever so much of what, we all are doing is more like language and language development and fourth features and so on. But Leon has the advantage of doing real work for real money. And so his presentations are very interesting because they show you what he's actually doing in real life. Yes, that's the thing. He has to deliver an actual working thing and uh, otherwise he'll starve to death. Uh, probably a good reason to have other sources of revenue, but uh, that's not unique to fourth, certainly. All right, on that cheerful note, I want to encourage any of you that are uh, interested, uh, perhaps have something uh, old that you presented, uh, even a quick update to it, or uh, even a review and saying, oh, gee, uh, this was a good thing, and uh, here's the link to the YouTube uh, video from the time I presented it uh, on fourth day, and uh, shortly after the Battle of Hastings, I think it was. Uh, anyway, anything like that, if you uh, want an idea, if you have an idea, uh, maybe we can conduct that conversation on Meetup. Uh, Pleased to talk to anybody about that stuff. I was thinking myself that uh, Ting 
did uh, in one of his fourth notebooks, maybe the first one, uh, a line drawing algorithm as part of his simple graphics package. And then later on, he did a talk to, uh, to uh, update that code. And it might be interesting to present that. I'm, uh, I'm sure there's a video of the, of the update and I have a copy of the fourth notebook. So uh, if anybody's interested in attacking that and presenting it on fourth day, uh, let me know, or even, you know, at some time in the future, you know, uh, anything that you'd care to present from uh, Ting's vast array of work uh, would be uh, welcome. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm just seeing Bill Ragsdale's picture. Is that, uh, is that locked in, Bill? Okay. Uh, on with the show. So get, get with me if you've got a fourth day talk, uh, if you ever gave a fourth day talk. If you've never given a fourth day talk, you owe me one. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to <laughs> to produce one, uh, you know, there's there's the case where you haven't given one, so you owe me one, and then there's the case where you've given one, so you know you've got to continue the practice. Well, for those of us who have not given one, how long does you have? How long do you have to? How much time do you have to take up? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we generally for YouTube audiences or Zoom audiences, we think of in terms of about 20 minutes, but it can be a gateway drug. Uh, you know, Klaus uh, went on for some months, uh, you know, not 20 minutes at a time, but certainly uh, some of his talks were, uh, were of reasonable length. Uh, so I think 20 minutes. Uh, and if you have something bigger than that, uh, you can, uh, do your own YouTube video and just give an introduction to the top and an overview uh, or uh, continue on for uh, months in the future. So strongly encouraged. Uh, the, so without 